Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Welcome to our 191st episode of our Health Updates webinar series. Thank you for being part of our credible online community. And to all those who have just discovered us today, welcome. And I hope this is an eye-opening webinar for everyone. Questions that we will be asking ourselves for today. Uh, have you ever wondered about the specialized needs of our nation's talented performing artists? Ito po yung mga dancers, musicians, uh, singers, mga actors po. No? They work on their craft and in working on their craft, they push their bodies and voices po to the limit. And with that dedication comes a unique set of medical concerns. So yun po, kailangan lang po siguro isipin kung paano po natin sila, paano po ba nila pinaayaalagaan ang kanilang mga katawan. Uh, in this week's uh, webinar, we'll be exploring uh, what is being called the burgeoning field, performing arts medicine dito po sa Pilipinas. We'll be discussing uh, musculoskeletal, neurological, vocal, psychological demands placed on performers and how these demands can translate into injuries overuse syndromes, and performance anxiety. I'm Dr. Raymond Francis Sarmiento, Director of the National Telehealth Center, National Institutes of Health, University of the Philippines, Manila. Always a pleasure to be with all of you during our Friday. Uh, for this Friday, my co-host will be Dr. Dion Sakdalan, who is the PGH coordinator for training. I think she's uh, running a little bit late uh, from a previous activity, uh, but we're hoping to have her uh, very, very soon po dito po sa ating show. So, I'll take this opportunity to uh, welcome, say hello to everyone who's watching us on the live broadcast of Zoom webinar and to all those watching via live streaming at TVUP YouTube channel. I hope that's working. But if not, then we'll be uploading after this one so that everyone can watch it on the playback. We are also present on UP System Facebook page, TVUP Facebook page, and of course, Lahat po na nanonood all those watching us from Signal TV, Channel 101. Our main presenter for today, uh, we've had her previously, I think last month or uh, several weeks ago lang po, very, very recently, uh, Dr. Jennifer Marie Yang. Uh, she has studied po ito pong culture, health, and medicine, uh, basically helping her apply it in her work as attending physician at the Philippine General Hospital's Department of Rehab Medicine. Our reactor, medyo may import po tayo from outside the Philippines. Uh, he is senior lecturer at the Nanyang Academy of Fine Arts in Singapore. That's Dr. Philomar Cortesano Tarriao. Ayan, nandiyan na po pala siguro si Dr. Dion, but we'll let her take uh, a few breaths. Uh, how are you, Dr. Dion? Hello, good afternoon. Sorry. Um, no problem. Just... Some stuff. But good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, I'm glad to be back as co-host of Dr. Raymond, and I'm very much interested and uh, curious about our webinar for today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dion. Um, so before we uh, dive right into uh, how healthcare workers po, no, tayo po, no, can be instrumental, paano po ba natin ma-optimize, matutulungan yung mga artistic talents po natin sa kanilang health, sa kanilang performance uh, in, in their craft will have our person on the street video. So uh, it's what we use to set our discussion into context, determining po kung ano po yung baseline knowledge ng ating audience for the topic at hand. Questions that we pose to our interviewees are as follows. Mayroon ka bang kakilalang performing artist? Kagaya ng artista, musikero, mananayaw, iba pa. Karaniwan po ba sa kanila ang nagpapatingin sa mga doktor? At kung nagpapatingin po sila, ano-ano kanilang mga pangkaraniwang sakit na nararamdaman, alam ba nila kung kanino magpapakonsulta kapag mayroong sakit na nararamdaman at ano po ang ginagawa ng ating mga performing artists, ng ating mga talents para mapanatili nilang malusog ang kanilang panangangatawan. Please watch this. Yes, I am I am a performing artist. I I have done multiple shows na already. Meron akong mga kakilala. Pero kung tatanungin na artista ba mga ganun, hindi ko sila personally kilala. Kilala ko lang sila bilang I I just know them. Yeah. Yes, ako ay isang performing artist. Bilang, uh, ako po ay isang professional singer. Given this, uh, marami akong kilala lang mga uh, performing artists, mga mananayaw, musikero. 
Well, personally, uh, I don't go to the doctor as much. Probably because I'm still young. I'm. I don't really experience um, physical fatigue as much, or like any injuries. However, I do know uh, a couple of theater artists as well who go to the doctor regularly. Personal na kilala ko. Oh, oh, oh. Dahil um, meron kami itinayong project pero uh, parang study kasi siya tungkol sa mga stroke patients. So, uh, nagkaroon dito ng tinatawag na gitara kung familiar kayo doon. So, yung mga stroke patients, uh, tinaruan sila mag guitar sa, sa mga kakilala ko, uh, wala akong masyadong nababalita na nagpapatingin ng doktor na regular, hindi madalas o napapag-usapan o naibabahagi sa isa't isa kung uh, dapat pa parating magpatingin sa doktor, ano ang reason kung bakit magpapatingin sa doktor. Because we do experience um, knee pain, knee injuries, voice. Um, also, it, it was great that you mentioned that theater, uh, p- performing artists, um, need mental help also because that is so true, especially when you're working with a really heavy role. Well, bukod sa regular check up, um, definitely kapag sa sa amin mga uh, musikero, lalo kapag kumakanta, uh, syempre ipapatay na amin um, vocal cords, uh, lalo na kapag um, nakasalalay dito ay yung sa mga ubo, sipon, at dahil ito ay malaking epekto sa pagkakanta, hindi makakakanta ang isang um, sikero kapag uh, inuubo at sipon. So yun ang parating uh, uh, kinakailangan yung halaga. So regular checkup is always important. My, my prof would recommend going to psych serve, especially when she's like doing a class or something and then we have to do a really heavy role. She would tell us, oh, go to psych serve because you need the support, you need the mental support. Again, sa totoo lang, hindi. <laughs> um, truth, di tood lang talaga. But, uh, Personally, I, I don't really go to doctors pa. Um, but yeah. As far as I know, you have to go to the EENT if you're having problems with your voice or you go to a physiotherapist if you're having problems with your joints or like parts of your body. Must not like exercise kami, ginagawa namin sa bahay yung mga ginawa natin sa therapy sessions. So ayun, nalalaman ko na ginagawa din nila yung part nila. Well, bilang isang singer, importante sa akin para ating uminom ng tubig, number one, uh, to keep my voice very hydrated. You exercise every day, you stretch every day, um, you build your stamina, that's very, very important. Uh, you take vitamins, um, you take care of your voice. Every day, I have to make sure that it's healthy, so checking up is, is definitely one thing that I have to value. Hey, thank you so much, TVUP. Uh, so very eye-opening. I think that will be that's the first time I've uh, seen that we've had interview with Spo, no? uh, from the performing arts. Yeah, just uh, makes me excited uh, for the presentation. Uh, Doctor Dion. Yes, um, I agree. It's eye-opening. No, um, sometimes we feel like our um, entertainers, musicians are always well because when the limelight is on, the spotlight is there. They're very pretty, they're very handsome, and very well. No, they entertain us and all. But um, we sometimes forget that they are also humans and they can get sick. That's one. And number two, of course, they want to prevent any injury. And uh, I think this webinar will be very much helpful for this subset of our population. So um, I'm already excited. Uh, Dr. Raymond, maybe some um, housekeeping rules? <clears throat> yes. Thank you, Dr. Dion. Uh, for those who are asking... Uh, so we've already sent out our certificates of attendance for all attendees of the 190 episodes. Again, you will be given a certificate of attendance if you have watched at least 50% of the webinar duration. We have also responded to several inquiries and requests. Uh, po sa kanila mga certificates. If you have any questions, as mentioned, uh, please feel free to email us. Uh, that's, that's really the best way for us to be able to check our records and then uh, answer all of your questions. For our webinar today, we'll be having a standard panel discussion format and after our speakers have presented that will be followed by our Q&A. Uh, 
NA session. So if you have any questions already, feel free to put them here. Dito po sa chat o kaya po sa ating Q&A box sa Zoom or in the comment section po natin sa Facebook. Okay, uh, I leave it to Dr. Dion to introduce our main presenter. Okay, I'm very much honored to introduce to you our main presenter. She's one of our consultants in the Department of Rehab Mel Re Rehabilitation Medicine in the UP Philippine General Hospital. Um, she's also um, a balik scientist, meaning she went abroad, trained, and eventually uh, decided to come back. Um, and she's been given that um, honor as a balik scientist in 2023. So to talk to us about how we can take care of our perform performing artists and maintain their wellness, please welcome to the virtual stage, Dr. Jennifer Marie Yang. Hi, Jenny. Hello. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Mm. Uh, virtual stage, indeed. <laughs> this is also a performance, di ba? Well, anyway, sige, I will start by sharing my screen. Here we go. Is that all visible to everyone? Yes, yes. If you yes. just go to okay. presenter. Yes, there we go. Yes, go there we go. Okay, yeah. So we will start with performing arts medicine, injury prevention, and health. Uh, as you can see, I have a stage here in my background. So why me? Why am I here? So I'm a rehabilitation medicine uh, specialist. I'm a medical doctor. Rehabilitation medicine is known with by many different um, names, uh, depending on where you are in the world. But we are the people who deal with function. So function is how you do tasks throughout the day. You eating, bathing, dressing, going to school, going to work, doing your work, and um, and how you do that. No, so we use a team approach. So we work with the physical therapists, the nurses, psychologists. Um, all sorts of people. Kasi hindi namin kaya kami lang. So, and we deal with the non-surgical management of mainly neurologic and musculoskeletal system. So why am I saying this? Because my um, performing arts medicine story is also my rehabilitation story. It's how I got into the specialty. Um, sometime in medical school, I typed in performing arts, which is one of my interests, and then the word medicine into a search bar and I'm going, oh, wow, that field actually exists. How do I get there? And that's how I got into rehabilitation medicine. This is me on graduation day. And this is me about three months ago uh, as we are as we were opening our uh, performing arts medicine clinic at the College of Music in UP Diliman. And just as an aside, uh, College of Medicine has this uh, variety show yearly called Taorin Pala. And... Today is the 50th year that they're going to have this. So that was a big part of my medical school life. I do not dance. I sing. I uh, I play in the band. So yun yung ano. I play the piano. So yun ang aking credibility as uh, performing artists. So we will talk about the basics, the five W's, and then go through the needs of uh, performing artists and, and my potpourri uh, section at the very end. So every year, there's a conference called the Medical Problems of Performing Artists. And in 2019, they also featured fight coordinators. So it's not just dancers and musicians, just because those are the most popular, you know, but it's also the people behind the scenes as well. So we are a branch of occupational medicine that formally addresses the medical complaints of those who play musical instruments, sing, dance, or even act and the and the acrobats also and puppet, puppet uh, puppeteers. Uh, we look at overall health prevention and management of injuries related to artists of all craft of all types as they practice their craft. Uh, so we have elements of sports medicine, occupational medicine, and plus the issues unique to the arts. Uh, we mentioned the guitar study earlier, so that is actually using music as therapy. Uh, you can also use dance as therapy, for example, for uh, people with Parkinson's disease. Uh, although that is sort of using the arts as medicine, it's not performing arts medicine. Uh, the other thing I have to emphasize here, it's not limited to rehabilitation medicine um, because you have, for example, uh, ear, nose, and throat doctors who look at the voice and you have psychologists or psychiatrists who look after the mental health of uh, performing artists. 
But being a rehabilitation medicine physician is useful because uh, of our focus on function. So there's been a sporadic... Uh, performing arts medicine has been around a long time in but not in a formal way. There have been sporadic case reports and articles, um, even go dating back to the 1700s. But really, it came about as a modern field in the 1970s and the 1980s uh, when these two musicians said, okay, I admit I'm injured, I need help. And they came public with their injuries. Uh, and then dance medicine started to separate itself from sports medicine around the same time. Uh, in 1983, they had the first annual symposium for medical problems of performing artists and then formalized uh, organizations in the 19, uh, 1988 and 1990, uh, as I put here. Um, and then there was this initiative uh, called Athletes and the Arts, which married the sports medicine and the performing arts medicine for the mutual benefit of both athletes and artists. Locally, we have Dance Medicine Philippines and Pamana PH, which we just formed last year, the Performing Arts Medicine as Advocates National Association of the Philippines. So it's a special interest group for performing arts medicine. Um, we're not up and running yet, but we're collecting people's uh, contact info in case that uh, during this year and next year, we will actually get together and do some organized uh, activities. So why are there unique issues in artists? So when you're a dancer, you're not going to say, uh, I'm an athlete. No, it's usually I am an artist. But to be an artist, you also have to be athletic. So um, for example, if you're seeing somebody who, who dances, they seem to do things very easily, but they've worked hard to do that. And they have to be athletic to actually do that. So they have to look pretty. With the musicians, you really don't see them as athletes, but they are actually small muscle athletes because they use their hands a lot to press keys um, or or uh, use their mallets for drums, for percussion. Um, hearing loss is also another issue in musicians, uh, also dancers. And then you have voice professionals who can be singers or broadcasters, reporters, actors. Um, with them, their voice is their instrument, their body is their instrument. So they have to be in pretty good condition, very fit. Um, the issue with all performing artists is they really don't like going to the doctor uh, or seeking any health care. They, they usually seek their teacher's advice first, just because that, number one, it's more accessible. The teacher sees them every day or, or every week or you know a little more regularly. Um, and they also like doing... Um, do-it-yourself treatments or alternative treatments before actually going to the medical um, system, just because that's that's the last resort. Usually, there's a fear that when you go to a doctor, the doctor will tell you, stop doing that. And as a performing artist, you don't want to hear that because it's your identity, diba. Right? Um, and then you also have this guilt about seeking help because it's like you're admitting that I have inferior talent, I'm unreliable, and that's how your colleagues in the profession might also see you. Um, and then you have this fear also that you're going to lose your gig because of that. Um, there's an underlying um, philosophy also of no pain, no gain, that I have to suffer so I can practice my craft. So this is something that we'd like to change that pain is actually a signal there's something wrong and it's not a badge of honor that you're an actual real artist because you're feeling pain. So it's a way of reinterpreting things. So the challenge here is getting the buy-in from the performing artist that healthcare is not something to be feared, but something that can actually help you uh, play longer and uh, uh, and with uh, and prolong your playing or your dancing life. And of course, you have payment issues. So because if you're not working, you don't have money to pay for the doctor. So that's going to be another uh, tipping point there. So who practices performing arts medicine? You have this whole list of people. So like I mentioned, it's not limited to physicians or uh, healthcare professionals. They can also be researchers, engineers, equipment uh, or instrument, instrument manufacturers, 
And these are all the people that benefit from performing arts medicines, not just the performers, but also the people backstage. So music producers, engineers, costume, makeup, props. Uh, so when does this happen? You can do performing arts medicine before, uh, before the season or before the performance with injury prevention and screening. You can do it during the performance or during rehearsal. You can incorporate things like the V sit up from Pilates into a performance. And then uh, this is probably the most well-known. Um, after injury, we have uh, the rehabilitation services for uh, performing artists. So where can you find performing arts medicine? Uh, you can find them in clinic space, offices, gyms. Uh, you can find them in rehearsal space, studios, and theater. Um, so this is me and my co uh, colleague from rehabilitation medicine, Francis Carlos. Um, we were sort of on call for Hamilton. Um, the physical therapist that travels with the company contacted us and um, if they had issues like back pain, then, then we would do a teleconsult or visit theater. Yeah. So this is our PGH experience. So, so we did a, a, a series of musician health talks with the UP Symphony Orchestra last year. So we discussed mindfulness, stretching, warm up, um, and uh, ergonomics for musicians and nutrition. And then... Just uh, this year, we started in February a performing arts medicine clinic at the UP College of Medicine. So this is our team, and uh, we saw patients. This clinic is open right now to the performing arts community, the faculty and students uh, of the University of the Philippines. Uh, we have it every second Saturday of the month, and so that's tomorrow. I will be plugging that, and uh, we'll see later how to schedule so in the Philippines, we actually have all the components to treat the artist's physical, emotional, and mental health. But there's really no concerted effort or widespread awareness, at least not yet. So that's what we're trying to do with the formation of PAMANA, uh, actually PAMANA PH, because it's uh, it's a Philippine thing. No? Uh, we need to reach out to educators and schools at all levels. We've started doing that already with the UP College of Music. Um, in a week, we will be reaching out to the ballet studios at their annual convention. Um, and, and that way, we're going to reach out to uh, teachers um, of uh, kids from you know three, five, seven-year-olds all the way to 16 and up. So those are our efforts right now. So with dancers, this is probably the most familiar and the most relatable of all performing arts medicine topics, just because it's very closely related to uh, sports medicine. So performing arts medicine has, it's an umbrella term and dance medicine is just part of that. Um, it investigates the causes of dancers' injuries, uh, promotes care and prevention, and rehabilitation. We look at the how of dance movement. Um, a lot of people, you know, 75 to 97 percent of dancers will have some injury uh, in their dancing career, and a lot of that is foot and ankle. And you can understand why. When you have a, a dancer, they're using their feet and ankles a lot, but it also depends on the genre. So ballet versus modern dance. With modern dance, they're on the floor, they're rolling, they're on their knees, uh, they do handstands. So the other body parts are also very involved. Compared to ballet, very few of the other body parts are involved. And then you have the risk factors for injury. You have uh, age, if they're novice, if they're uh, professional, that matters. Uh, people with hunger, thirst, fatigue, they're more uh, prone to having injury. Um, Prior injuries also a risk factor. Um, and then you have the intrinsic factors, which is outside the person. So, for example, you have costumes, shoes, or the lack of shoes. Uh, you have the genre and the choreography. For this person here, Sayo Sabanko, you go uh, jump up and down and in, uh, in the bare feet. So that's a risk factor for injury if you do that repeatedly. Uh, situational factors. So if you have mental or emotional distress, you're more at risk for injury also. 
So dancing is dangerous. It's fun, but it can be dangerous because you're you're jumping a lot and you have a small base of support and you're moving. So you're constantly challenging your balance. You're constantly challenging your ligaments, your tendons, your muscles, um, and you're, you can be prone to overuse. Uh, muscle imbalance is also an issue because if one set of muscles is stronger than the other, that can be a risk factor. And how do you prevent injury? So you listen to your body, do not dance to the pain. We'll go into this uh, a little later, go uh, a little deeper into this. Uh, you can build core strength and balance and cross train to build your endurance so you don't fatigue easily. Um, you do adequate warm up, cool down, stretching, flexibility, uh, get enough rest and sleep so you're not too tired. Hydration and nutrition are also important to keep your body in as good as a condition as, as it can be though, while performing. And then looking at environment, costume, and shoes. So these people are not dancers. They're beauty queens. But then if you think about dancing in these costumes, they're going to be a little hard. So uh, that's why you have to be aware also of what, uh, what you're wearing. So with pain... So you have to listen to your body. You, you have to avoid dancing to the pain, uh, even minor pain. So this set of guidelines is from Johns Hopkins, and I thought they were very on point to, uh, to, get, to use the dance pun. Uh, in most cases, muscle soreness lasts about a day or two. However, it, if it lasts longer than that, and the pain wakes you up for, at night and it's present at the start of activity and it's worse during an activity. And you start compensating for that pain by changing your moves, your steps, then that's probably an injury and you might need to seek help. So with musicians, we usually don't think of them as athletes. So usually the problems are not recognized. So um, in performing arts medicine, if dance is analogous to sports medicine, this one is more... Um, occupational and we deal with ergonomics a lot fitting the musician to their instrument so again a lot of people do have uh, problems that can interfere with performance this is the first study ever from 1986 82 percent had problems a lot of them were musculoskeletal but there were also non-musculoskeletal problems like hearing and uh, vision, even hemorrhoids, and allergies, and stage fright. So why is it dangerous? Well, they are fine motor athletes. Overuse is common because you have to practice a lot. Um, endurance and postures. Posture. So this picture uh, shows bad posture, bad alignment. Um, and if you are in an awkward posture for a long period of time, that can cause uh, pain and cause injury also. Marching bands are another story because they're playing their instruments while walking around. So they have to be in very good condition. Plus, that's the gross motor. No? Um, big muscles are moving. Plus, they have to do the fine motor uh, playing of their instruments. So, And musicians have a diverse population because... Because of their age, because of their level of playing, are they amateurs, professionals, the setting, and the type of instrument. So again, you have risk factors for injury, uh, individual factors. Females are generally more uh, at risk for injury because a lot of the uh, lot of the instruments are one size fit fits all, and they're fitting the male hand size. Um, stress and anxiety and ligamentous laxity. Uh, general health and conditioning are also important. I, a note about this ligamentous laxity, both for musicians and dancers, with hypermobile people, when their ligaments that are holding the joints together are very lax, your muscles are working extra hard to stabilize your joints. So um, you're at more at risk for pain because of that. So it can be asset, you can be more flexible, which is desired in some art forms but then you can be at risk for pain also. So this is one of the criteria for um, ligamentous laxity. It's a nine-point scale, and this is one of the uh, tests for it. And then um, environmental factors. So the condition of the instrument and the poor instrument fit are probably the more important more the parts here uh, for, uh, for musicians, um, whether their space is cramped, 
and the furniture are they fit to you um as an as an instrumentalist is the chair too high too low and all that practice habits can also be an issue if you don't take enough breaks if you uh have long practice sessions um that can be a problem and changes in training or practice new teacher new instrument new technique uh can be a problem also so how do you prevent injury same thing with the um with the dancers this is an identical slide really except for the taking breaks so usually 5 to 10 minutes per hour of practice that's a good break and uh the environment is different instead of like a dancer moving across the stage, you have musicians in an orchestra pit. So the space can be cramped. Uh, the space can have poor lighting. Um, you have bad postures because it's a cramped space. You're trying to fit as many people, as many chairs and music stands in a very small space. So again, identical slide, listen to your body, avoid playing to the pain, even minor pain. Uh, pain more than one to two days, then that's a problem. And the thing here, that pain that makes you change the way you play, a change in technique, or do compensatory movements uh, is a problem. So things to watch out for. Uh, you can do instrument modifications, like the chin rest and the shoulder rest for the violinists to help them um, figure out the best way to fit the violin to you. Same thing with the flute. You can bend the the head of the flute to get your neck in a more neutral position um, with straps for instruments a wider strap will distribute the pressure better um, than a thinner strap so hopefully less pain from that um, there is an organization called pianists for alternatively sized keyboards so you have a standard keyboard if you have small hands, you it's going to be harder to reach the keys. So there are 15, 16, 15 over 16 scale keyboards and 7 over 8 scale keyboards for smaller hands. And then I don't know what this is called, but it helps you hold the trombone better so you don't grip it. And this one is uh, a device that will help your guitarists uh, have a more neutral uh, posture instead of hunching over the guitar. So other performing artists, really briefly, for vocal professionals, broadcasters, singers, reporters, theater actors, your body is your instrument. Posture and alignment is, is key to get your air moving from your lungs up to your windpipe, up to your oral cavity to form those words. No? Um, so breathing with proper technique, um, uh, it can be trained, can be uh, can be part of your regimen as a teacher teaching your students. Um, general fitness is important because when you're not tired, you have a better sound. Um, you have to watch out for vocal over overuse and abuse. So, uh, risk of reflux, the risk of uh. Of vocal ever of injury to your vocal cords is greater if you have caffeine, alcohol on board, if you have tobacco smoke on board, uh, hormonal changes with aging also. So you have singers who it it's a muscle. It's voice is can be thought of as a muscle. Um, you have um, uh, as you age, you have to keep those muscles in good condition, and those can also change with with your hormones so after menopause, for example. So more complex issues in people who sing, dance, and act because you have different muscles um, all, uh, all working together. And then, of course, since we're rehab, we can't do everything. We have to refer to our ear, nose, and throat and speech therapy colleagues. So other performers, special needs, you have acrobats and aerialists. You have, they have to have very good core strength in performing what they do. Um, you have puppeteers who have very poor, po awkward postures while they're performing. So these people are looking at a monitor uh, while they're actually performing with, uh, with the Muppets in their hands. Uh, figure skaters, synchronized swimmers, pole dancers. This is the crossover between dance medicine and sports medicine. Again, they have to look pretty while doing their sport. 
Uh, and then you have people who are music producers, for example, or or uh, audio sound engineers. They have issues with computers and desks and their consoles. These people don't have good posture in this picture. So that's something we can help with. Um, and then here we have everybody else that we can help, uh, the background folks. And finally, a mix that uh, of things that are not musculoskeletal. You have neurologic issues like a headache, for example. It's going to be hard to dance if you're if you have a migraine. Uh, conditions likely more common in performing artists, but the focal dystonia is when an artist is doing a task specific thing, like playing the violin or playing the piano, and their fourth and fifth fingers curl up like this. Um, involuntarily, no? So that can be career ending, uh, something to uh, that, that we can help with also. Um, it's, and we need the team approach for that. And then conditions like tremors, for example, can you imagine somebody who's playing the trumpet and then they have a tremor? So it's, you know, if it was just somebody who is an office worker, the tremor won't really matter too much with their occupation. But if your livelihood depends on playing that trumpet and you have a tremor, then that's a different story. And then others, you have concussions, uh, you have neuropathies also. Uh, with nutrition, you should time your meal about two hours before your performance and you have, should have adequate in, intake of your your nutrients, uh, the carbohydrate, fats, and protein, the macronutrients, and the micronutrients, which are the vitamins and minerals. Uh, a note about what we call the female athletic triad, which has been um, expanded to relative energy deficiency in sport. So with athletes, they generally expend a lot of energy doing what they do, running, swimming, dancing, um, but sometimes they don't eat enough, especially if they're trying to keep their weight down. Uh, so you have an energy deficiency. You don't have enough energy in your body. And your body says, oh, I should shut down the uh, the non-essential things like reproduction. So it affects your hormones. When it affects your hormones, that can also affect your bone density. So your your bone is not as solid. They don't. It doesn't have enough calcium. You're, you can be prone to... Uh, stress fractures, so something to look out for. And of course, hydration, uh, important for dancers uh, and singers as well. Uh, a few more notes, mental imagery. So if a person cannot practice physically, they can think about what they're doing uh, and that can count as practice. Psychology can also help performance anxiety and emotional distress. Uh, hearing loss is very important, especially for musicians. Uh, so you have these things called baffles that dampen the uh, the noise. Um, uh, dental and facial pain is important for singers and with instruments, instrumentalists. Um, respiratory problems, also important for any musician, but especially for singers and wind instrumentalists. So the people who are here from Hamilton, they were bothered by Manila's polluted air and haze, and it really made it difficult for them to sing, even if they were inside the theater. Um, and then you have age-related changes. So as we age, people have osteoarthritis, impaired coordination and balance, and then Hearing and vision loss can be devastating for, for a musician or a dancer also. Imagine if you can't see where you're going or see what you're playing. Uh, in the arts community, there's also a lot of HIV and AIDS. So we have to be aware of the problems with the disease itself or the medications. And in the arts community, there's also substance abuse just because sometimes you can use those substances to help with creativity. So... Another iffy uh, topic in this area. Finally, prevention is key. Uh, for And you have to identify risk factors during assessment. You have to be aware of the unique demands on performing artists. You have to speak their language and because they will be more receptive if you know what these steps are called. You know what a point shoe looks like. You know what a releve, a, a fuete, a plie is. 
for example, for ballet. No? And then returning to performing after injury, this is what a lot of people fear. It's not all or nothing. If dancing makes you, uh, if make dancing makes your knee hurt, you don't want to hear don't dance. No, we want to take a graduate gradual approach in helping that injury. Maybe we will do conditioning exercises first and then be a little more focused on that knee injury later. Um, and you have to listen to your body and performing to the pain is not ideal as we mentioned earlier. And here is a plug. Um, so the Performing Arts Medicine Advocates National Associations of the Philippines, Pamana PH, this is our website. Uh, right now, uh, it's a special interest group. And uh, if you want to be updated on what we're doing, um, you can scan this QR code or you can contact contact me uh, right here. I have my contact information and then we can figure out how we can help. We'd like to be, uh, a, um, how do I say this, uh, a core for networking between health professionals, performing artists, performing arts educators, and uh, lay people who are interested in funding the performing arts health. Uh, and then this other QR code is for our clinic, uh, every second Saturday of the month at UP Diliman uh, at the College of Music. So right now it's open to UP uh, uh, Performing Arts Community, whether in Diliman or Manila or anywhere else in the university system. Um, and uh, tomorrow is uh, May 11, that's the second Saturday, we will have clinic there uh, at the Conservatory of Music or College of Music. And that's the link for scheduling. And that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, over to you, uh, Dion and Raymond. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jenny Yang, uh, for well th that part in terms of uh, no, no. dancers are closest because of the sports medicine <laughs> and, uh, association. Yes. For, uh, <laughs> that's my biggest takeaway. Um, Dr. Dion, any reaction? Quick reactions? Lang po. No, I'm just very delighted that... Um... Uh, we have this field of medicine or a specialization in medicine that really focuses on um, the unique um, needs and probably issues or concerns, health concerns of our uh, performers. No, They're a very special population, very creative ones. Actually, we need them, right? Every day, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that we go to. If we're sad, we watch movies, we go to a, a play or we go to some music event and and um, having that, that field of medicine and take care of these very creative people very important now in the um, practitioners um taking care of uh, make it accessible to a lot more people so thank you very much dr yang and uh, for that information all right, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jenny. Reminding everyone again that uh, if you already have your questions at the ready, we encourage you to put them in dito po sa ating uh, Q&A box in the Zoom uh, or the, in the comment section po in the uh, Facebook pages that we mentioned. I think there's a uh, there's an issue that we have right now in terms of uh, YouTube streaming, but don't worry, we'll have that up and running in the TVUP uh, YouTube channel uh, pretty soon uh, and you'll be able to watch it on the playback for today's webinar. Um, so we, for our reactor today, we are, so as mentioned pa kanina po, no, we had to import someone. Uh, but uh, don't worry, uh, my understanding is uh, our reactor is a classmate of Dr. Jenny Yang. Now, currently, he's based in Singapore. He's senior lecturer of the Nanyang Academy of Fine Arts. Uh, please welcome to your screens, Dr. Philomar Cortizano Tarial. Uh, Salamat Tangahari from Singapore. Uh, good afternoon from Singapore. Uh, <clears throat> just a note, I mean, uh, why I'm here is, uh, well, because I'm a doctor of medicine as well. We were classmates, uh, Jenny and I, but I left practice to actually perform on stage. So I could relate with whatever Jenny was talking about. So congratulations, by the way, Jenny, for your strides in performing arts medicine in the Philippines. Um, I just like to highlight like what you said that um, for performers, our skill and our 
profession is actually part of our identity. So it's it's just very true. Like in my case, if when I got injured and I basically stopped performing, it actually affected uh, how I lived. You know, I, I went through a bit of uh, depression during that time. So uh, I have a question for this sense. How close do you work with the counselors, for example, in PGH, in providing help, particularly for these artists, let's say, yeah, um, in their mid careers who get injured, you know, and then, and it's a, it's a, a very, how do you say this, um, very difficult injury uh, to get out of. So yeah, that's a, that's a question for, for me, particularly because performing arts medicine is a very collaborative and multidisciplinary field. Is that a question for me? Yes, Sana. <laughs> okay. So we do have, uh, oh, I should probably turn on my video. Sorry. So, so we, we do have rehabilitation psychologists available. Uh, we're not set up yet to, to do this uh, specifically for performing artists, but they are available in our department. Um, there is, uh, sorry, there are more than one uh, mental health uh, organizations in the Philippines that uh, that deal with this. They do both telehealth, uh, mental health counseling, and in-person mental health counseling. So we can refer to them. I don't have the names of those organizations right now, but I know that Ballet Philippines has done that. Uh, for their dancers, they they have a partnership with a mental health organization. So so that's like I mentioned before. There, all the components are here in the Philippines. They're just not uh, all together, together. yet. Yeah. Yes. So maybe that's uh, one of the goals of PAM, not to bring everybody together. Because yeah. and that's think... one of the goals we want with Pamana PH. Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. and I think it's very important, particularly when you have a conservatory like University of the Philippines. There, no, because by the time they actually reach the healthcare professional, mm -hmm. the injuries actually may be very bad already. Yeah, so um, I so I think like what you said, Jennifer, uh, that prevention is key. So and I think that should start with the educators as well. So if they are on board with this, yeah, that will be really great. Like for example, the way the technique is taught, like what you said, no. For for those of us like for me, no, I was trained very old school. Uh, pain is a badge of honor. There's a saying that that goes, "There's no beauty without pain," and we are in the aesthetic and um, in the aesthetic business. So um, educators, I think, need. I, I hope there are educators here in this uh, webinar, and if you are here, please post your questions because they are very important. Yeah. Um, I'd like to ask Jennifer, like, um, aside from the Conservatory of Music in UP, um, where else have you actually reached out in the Philippines to mm -hmm. actually educate? Um, yeah. Yeah. So next week, next Saturday, we're actually talking at the uh, Association of Ballet Academies of the Philippines. They have their oh. annual convention next week, Saturday and Sunday, and we will be reaching out to the educators there uh, who you know who start with baby ballet at age three and worked all the way up to 16 and above. Uh, we have a session on dance injury medicine, uh, injury and prevent prevention. And then we also have a session on um, first aid for the ballet studios. Mm -hmm. So what happens if somebody has a sprain? What can you do? Or somebody has a concussion? Uh, what can you do? Uh, stuff like that. And it's going to be, it, it won't be all me. We will have a panel of rehab medicine doctors who are uh, who are actually dancers themselves. And they'll be oh, doing, wow. yeah, the, so they'll be sharing their own experience plus their medical expertise. That's so good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, so it's good that you're connecting with uh, the teachers, mm -hmm. right? And so I think there will be good that, you know, there's screening. I mean, right now here in Singapore, um, I started that when I started teaching the dance sciences here, that we have a screening for the dancers to know if they're hypermobile. Yeah, the Byton score is very important, which you highlighted. It's a mm -hmm. nine-point system. So we actually identify the dancers who are at risk of getting um, strains or sprains because of 
of genetics, basically. Um, I do have another question because um, the economics of it, you know, mm -hmm. so a lot of these professional artists are in the gig industry, right? So when they consult, usually, again, it's at a very bad stage already of their injury. So pag nagkonsulta sila, uh, ayun, mahirap na, so maraming kailangan gawin. Yeah. What is the insurance coverage right now? Like, dito, meron bang mga nag insure ng professional artists? Good question. <laughs> yeah, because like here in Singapore, no, pag sinabi mong dancer ka, yung insurance premium mo biglang tataas dahil uh, yun nga eh, they know that, hey, your profession it's up to 97% yes. will get injured. So, what is the climate there in the Philippines right now regarding insurance for artists? It depends. If they are in a, if they are in a company, they might have an HMO, uh, health management organization. Um, if they are in a company that does not have that agreement with the HMO, it might still be self-pay. And then you have the, uh, you know, you have, there's Phil K, Phil Health for universal healthcare, but it really that doesn't cover much with outpatient, um, uh, with outpatient services. So that it might be self-pay more than anything else. Um, Dr. Raymond. Uh, you're nodding your head, so you might know a little more about yeah, this. Yeah, so it, it is, it's the same. That, 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 that's what I was going to say, um, Dr. Jenny. Actually, I have a uh, um, personal message, but probably, you know, seeing her in push. Yeah. The question would be, I, I'm sure if uh, Dr. Tariao is done, po, no, I think we can, if we can entertain some questions. Na lang po. Um, how do I tell... That it's typical, I guess, baka tanong po niya, it's typical vocal strain and it's already a vocal fold injury. That, and then, kailangan na daw po niya magpatingin, Dr. Ayang. Yeah. Actually, I'm not an ear, nose, and throat or person. So, <laughs> I really don't know. But in, in general, with pain, it... Uh, it, it this is not pain, no? Y yung issue niya. But in general, if it goes away within a day or two after resting... Then yes, maybe it's strain, uh, but to really be sure that there's nothing underlying going on, you really have to see somebody who can look at your vocal folds, and then Ay, go from there. Ayun po. Dito po sa nag-message po sa akin yung po. Kailangan po talaga masilip siya <clears throat> ng uh, ENT na specialist. I think this one naman might be along your alley, uh, Doctor Jenny. I'm a dancer, but. Uh, uh, I frequently deal with tight hamstrings. Mm -hmm. uh, do stretching exercises uh, really help? Because, I mean, it looks like uh, she's not the type to stretch yet yes. for her. Uh, mm. so, so, yes, they do. Yeah, just because muscles are very <laughs> uh, moldable. So... Mm. The more you move them, the more they will be flexible. Uh, there's also what we call dynamic stretching and static stretching. Dynamic stretching is when you're moving as you stretch. Static stretching is when you sit down and just stretch, like when you're right there. So I think you should do a combination of both mm -hmm. instead of just one or the other. Um, Philomar, Doc Phil, you might have mm -hmm. something more to add to this because you uh, are also yeah. a Pilates instructor. Yes. Aside from okay. everything um, else. <laughs> so active stretching is the best. Um, static stretching, if you want plasticity, what does plasticity mean? You want mm. your muscles to lengthen a little bit more, but you also want your muscles to be able to rebound, like in jumping. So elasticity <laughs> is important. Mm. That's why active stretching or there's what we call proprioceptive uh, stretching. Yeah, proprioceptive neurofacilitated stretching. So it's uh, you can Google that and there's... Mm. Yeah, there's a video on how to do that. And it's really, really good. It improves your stretch. And at the same time, it improves both plasticity and elasticity of your muscles, which we dancers love. You know, we want to do our splits in the air and land gracefully. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and you've got a very good um, perspective on this because you have the medical background. You are a dancer and dance educator. So you've, you know, you've seen everything. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Doctor Dion, did and you have injured. any question? Uh, because I just have one more. But uh... well, um, I think uh, Phil earlier mentioned about educating the educators, and I think that's very important. No, we just don't 
teach the skill, we also want to make sure that our artists know how to take care of themselves so they will be able to perform for a longer period of time. So part of teaching the skill is maybe knowing how to uh, prevent injuries and, and mm -hmm. those stretching and all those technical terms, mm -hmm. which I don't really understand, will really matter for the educators to know so that as mentioned already, prevention is better than cure, right? So we mm -hmm. don't want to just treat. We want to prevent those injuries from happening um, for uh, for our performers. So this, there's really no question, but hopefully um, maybe with a growing um, field in the country, uh, we also um, include the educators um, in in, in yes. helping them mm. teach the performers, mm. future performers also. Ako naman, uh, ano, I, I, I have a, have a yeah, my final question would be on the uh, uh, Dr. Tariyaw as a performer. Sir, how do you, ano, do you still experience performance anxiety and how do you deal with that up to now? If, uh, if, if, you, if you still do. I do, I do. In fact, that's one of the reasons where, where why I re retired from dancing because I couldn't do a lot of the stuff I could do mm -hmm. before when I was younger. So the performance performance society is quite real. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. uh, but... Uh, pero when, when you were performing, um, how did you deal with it? Uh, well, I usually like the performances at night, the whole day is spent on focusing. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, well, I think I'm quite disciplined and until now. I wake up at six in the morning. I warm up for two hours. So I go to the gym and then I teach. And that has not changed in the past. Mm -hmm. I've been performing since 1996. So that has not changed wow. at all. So that's, it, it's the discipline. Okay. Like what my uh, a former mentor of mine told me, when motivation is gone, discipline will replace it. So I think that's the best way to counteract performing mm -hmm. anxiety is to have a routine mm -hmm. that you can mm -hmm. stick with and that can give you confidence as you go along. Yeah. 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 A lot of this is mindfulness. Uh, with with the UP Symphony Orchestra, they actually have focusing sessions before their performance. So mm -hmm. aside from uh, the physical warm up that we've sort of taught them uh they said oh yeah we also have the the mental warm up which they've already done before we got there so said so it's very good mm -hmm. okay good yeah thank you so much i think that should be it but at this point we'll be we only have a few minutes so we'll um launch our evaluation poll it's five questions it's a four point likert scale if we can have that be shown on the screen and while that is being prepared, there you go. If you can see it, uh, nandito po siya, ta, pangalan po, panel discussion, Paul. I'll greet those who ha, are our avid watchers, Paul, or avid viewers, those who are joining us from Philippine Science High School, Cagayan Valley Campus in Bayombong, Nueva Vizcaya, po. Uh, Air Force City Hospital in Mabalak at Pampanga. There are those from Cebu Provincial Hospital in Carcar City in Cebu. From Bulacan, yung Bataan, maraming salamat po. From Notre Dame de Chartres Hospital in ba Baguio, Benguet. Southern Philippines Medical Center in Davao City, Davao del Sur. And Oriental Mindoro Provincial Hospital in Calapan, Oriental Mindoro. We'd also like to greet those who are watching us internationally. Uh, from the Chonin Hospital in Taipei City in Taiwan. Nam Canto University Hospital in Canto City in Vietnam. And University Fail in Ha'il, Saudi Arabia. So maraming maraming salamat po. Uh, Dr. Dion, what did we have in store for them for next week? Oh, well, before that, we'd like to thank, of course, our speaker and our actor, Phil and Dr. Jenny Yang, for, um, for being here with us and uh, imparting your very important knowledge and um, you know, uh, performing artists medicine or performance medicine um next week i think we will be having a very 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 special guest our past chancellor of the up manila system uh chancellor padilla will be our guest and we will inform you of the topic of chancy uh but we will look forward to that dr raymond thank you so much uh, before we conclude our program all of our webinars are archived for viewing at the tvup youtube channel you go to www.youtube.com forward slash tvupph for all of our 190 after today 191 episodes na po and including there's also a tab there on shorts youtube shorts dun din po ninyo makita our uh, nuggets of wisdom that we have 
uh, prepared for you. Very, very short videos. And hopefully, that's something that you find insightful and interesting. Po. So, this formally brings to a close our webinar for the week. Again, thank you so much to Dr. Jenny Yang and to uh, Dr. Philo Marta Riau, our performing arts and medicine po na experts. And uh, hopefully, that's something that we could continue to uh, form part of our mainstream discussion. We look forward to your company again next Friday from 12 noon to 1 p.m. It's a date. Together, we can stop preventable deaths. So keep safe, keep healthy, and see you online.